Thank you for checking out this video. Today I have as my guest Susanna. She's a mother who's using a pseudonym to protect herself and her family's identity. When you hear what she has to say, you will understand very clearly why she feels she has to do this. Susanna and I are going to have a discussion about her experience as a mother of a child who has rapid onset gender dysphoria. I've been making many videos about this issue of rapid onset gender dysphoria and nothing that I have said should in any way be misconstrued as being hateful toward trans children, trans adults, trans anybody, because that's not where I'm coming from. I've worked with many people as a clinician, as an instructor, as a friend. I've interacted with, talked to, worked with people with a variety of different trans issues or sexual orientation or gender role, gender identity, the wide gamut. And there is some intersection. There is a lot of confusion over what all of these things really mean. But the one thing that we found out is recently this term rapid onset gender dysphoria is just blown up and it's affecting a lot of kids. And I know that you have had a child who's experienced this. So can you talk about what that is, what she went through and what the children of parents that you've been talking to have been going through? Not only the experience of ROGD, but the experience of trying to get help through the medical system and these gender-affirming clinics. So can you speak to that? The experience of trying to get help, to be quite honest, it has completely eroded our confidence in psychology, in the entire field of psychology, and um, the medical profession as well. We don't trust the psychologists anymore to provide proper therapy, to really take the time to understand what's going on and drill down and really try to get to know our children and see why they're feeling the way that they do. And if people have checked out my other videos on this topic, they've heard other people who have worked with children and adults with these gender issues, and they do do what you're saying. They question, why would somebody at the age of 14 or 15, after never showing any signs of any confusion or discomfort or anything like that about their identity, about their gender roles or anything, suddenly they're just going to out of the blue say at the age of 14 or 15 after they've gone through puberty I'm a boy if they're female or vice versa. So it's a little hard for you to believe too. Well it's just like where is this coming from? Right, right. that's the issue where is it coming from and so if you ask the so-called experts they will give you a variety of answers and the most common answer is well they were always this way but you just were not an attentive enough parent you shut them down you never let them feel comfortable and safe enough to be able to express who they really are so shame on you they've been hiding this for 15 years and because of brave therapists and activists we've now given them a voice to truly be who they are so how does that jibe with your own experience whether it's with your own family or with all the many parents that you've spoken with. We're just told, accept it. Nobody questions it. It's just go ahead. If they say they're transgender, then they are. And yay for them. Let's all celebrate and change their names and give them hormones. And so if someone says to you, so what's so wrong about accepting a child who says, you know, call me this name and I want to dress differently and forget the hormones, forget the binding the breasts. What if they just say that they want to assume a different identity? What is the problem with that? Well, there is no problem with that. From my understanding of child developmental psychology, children do that. They're supposed to do that. And it's kind of a natural part. What do they call, what do you call it? Gender identity formation mm -hmm, or something part, yeah. this is, is what it's called. So, so as the mother of four children, it's easy to see. They each go through their own, especially as teenagers, they're questioning. I mean, everybody knows they try on things. They try different hairstyles. They want to get a tattoo, whatever. They're just, just trying to find out who they are. It's natural. It's normal. So you don't question it. Right, and that's what people have to understand, that we're not just talking about a young child who is either to a minimal degree or to a further degree where they say, I'm going to really grow up my hair and everything. We're not talking about that. We're talking about children who, often as teens, with ROGD, we are talking post-pubescent in virtually every case. And in most cases, it's girls, which is the exact opposite of what all the stats used to show, where it was often a biological boy's experience. So these are two very different things. That, that 
that's kind of the key thing that I wanted to specify, where the gender therapists will say, oh, well, if they say they're a boy, then they're a boy, and we have to start treating them like a boy and put them on the path to transition. We're not lumping them all together. It's important to look at gender dysphoria, take the time to really understand it, and look at what's already known about gender dysphoria. There's a really good article on Fourth Wave Now called Gender Dysphoria is Not one thing, and it's written by Drs. Bailey and Blanchard. Both of them describe three different categories of gender dysphoria, two of which are well recognized and well studied. They've been around for years. They know what they are. Dr. Amite, can you tell me which ones? Well, that's Dr. Blanchard's taxonomy, where he talks about the homosexual, transsexual, and the autogynophilic transsexual. And it causes a lot of controversy. And if you look in the links, everything we talk about will be in the description. And Dr. Blanchard and I have talked extensively about these different types. And there's some blowback in the community because not everybody likes that taxonomy. But those are two that have been around for many years. They have been supported by people who say that does describe me. And then there are several other types. Uh, the other few that he talks about are less common, but the third one is the ROGD. And that's only being discussed in the last couple of years because it's a relatively new phenomenon, which leads us to believe that there is some type of social contagion. And I know that as we talk, Suzanne has a lot of materials that she's gathered over her time working in this field. And I know that there are some falsehoods that are being portrayed and that you want to address some of those. This new type of transgender phenomenon that we are seeing, this new type of gender dysphoria, it's different than anything else because instead of children feeling this way from a very young age and then fearing having to go through puberty or struggling through puberty, they went through their childhood pretty much without problem, at least in this area. They went through puberty, no problem. So now it's post-puberty, maybe it's around their age of 14, 15 years old. Again, it's mostly girls. And most of them describe a very similar phenomenon or similar experience. So through your experience, would you like to share some of these traits or experiences that you've sure, seen? The traits that we're seeing is, uh, as you said, post-adolescence mostly. Um, and they've had no signs of gender dysphoria in childhood. They were perfectly happy, but oh, maybe they didn't like to wear dresses if they were girls or something, you know, but nobody cares about that anyway anymore. ROGD also was predominantly teenage girls. Now, it doesn't mean exclusively there are some boys coming up with this, but mainly it's girls. Another really significant factor is that they have pre-existing psychosocial issues that really often make them feel like outsiders. They um, don't know how to get along with the other kids in the schools. They don't fit in. Some of the really ones that keep coming up from the parents are attention deficit, ADHD, autism, and also borderline personality disorder. Which they wouldn't be diagnosed with at that time. It comes out later that we realized that they were forming this personality disorder because we won't usually diagnose them till 16 to 18, usually right. in the later years. But they do end up showing many of the traits and the symptoms of this. People have to understand, especially with autism, a child who is struggling with feeling left out, excluded, maybe not comfortable with who they are, if they have autism, they are more likely than other children to gravitate towards something, some explanation, and that they rigidly adhere to that. They found an explanation and it becomes almost like a tunnel vision, and so they can become almost obsessive with it. So it can seem like, whoa, they have a very strong case of gender dysphoria, whereas it's no, they're confused, as most children are those days, and they found something to hang their hat on, where they go, oh, this is what it is, it's and, transgender. And would you say that their behavior would most likely be insistent, consistent, and persistent? <laughs> yes, very very much so. And because of this consistency and persistence, the doctor is saying, you see, these are what we see with children who typically are truly gender dysphoric. They're not just going through a phase. This is real. It's legitimate. And if you don't affirm it, you're going to cause them great harm. And we'll be talking about this, but this is complete emotional blackmail where they say your kid will kill themselves. And I'm sure you hear from a lot of parents who have reached out to you saying that's what they were told. If you don't go along with it 100%, your child has an incredibly high chance that they're going to kill themselves. Their blood is on your hands. Yeah, they don't shy away from that at all. You see that a lot. Uh, just to finish, the sort of the typical things that we're seeing is that uh, social media and internet use is huge. It seems like they all form groups on the internet. They're all talking to each other. They're supporting each other. They're encouraging and goading. 
I understand, Dr. Amate, you can tell me more about this maybe. Uh, that's a real issue with um, anorexics as well on the internet. They all get each other. And they yes, get and they, they, they even have these terrible websites. Anna. That websites. was Anna. A N A right. websites. Right. And they were glorifying. You're glorifying a horrible condition that leads to deaths. At least a complete illness. It just it, it destroys you psychologically. And this was the first time ever where, on a grand scale, people are being rewarded for having these very unhealthy behaviors, mindsets, beliefs about themselves, about what's normal. And as social animals, we rely on the people and the things around us to determine what is real, what is good, what is normal, what is valuable. And so if that's the message being conveyed, for example, with anorexia, or in this case, with being trans, and it's not just autistic children, any child is going to gravitate toward what is seen as cool or proper or good or accepting. Right. What we're seeing, you know, I hear it a lot from the, the parents that write in and the parents that I'm speaking with. The children really, they withdraw from real life because they've found this group online that's going to support them and encourage them and, and all of that, what you were just saying. They, right. they, they found acceptance in this group online, but they can't fit in in their real life. So they just withdraw right. and they spend all their time on the internet. Or in the description there's links and the parents of ROGDKids.com, which Susanna helped start, is so important. So if parents want to get resources and there's not just this site but other sites devoted to parents trying to help each other, trying to get information because of the many parents who have contacted me over the past year since I've been making these videos. You now there are some parents who I know, they have a strong issue with transgender, homosexuality, with anything else like that. There are some parents like that. And sadly, they will not accept their child being whoever they are. They have a very rigid belief of how their child should be. But that's the very tiny minority of people. Everybody else I've spoken with, all they want is what's best for their child, and they want help. They want direction. And they've been told, as we all have, in times of need, you seek out the professionals and the experts. And Suzanne and I are going to talk about why, sadly, when it comes to transgender issues, that's a falsehood. And there are some good experts, there are some good researchers, there are good clinicians, but there are also many who are being driven by ideology. It might be their own traumas, their own past that they're trying to process through the lives of these kids. A lot of the trans activists are not the types of transgender children that we're seeing. The trans kid who from a very, very young age was very, for example, if it's a boy, was very effeminate. And from day one, people knew there's something different about this child. It's a very different phenomenon. So those are the homosexual transsexuals, whereas the loudest activists are by and large autogynophilic transsexuals. These are two very different types of phenomena, yet they're all being lumped under the same umbrella. And most worrisome is that many other people who, if you left them alone as children, would just turn out to be typically gay or they might just be, they might be heterosexual but tomboys. They just don't fit in neatly to your stereotypical gender role. But a gender role is very different from a gender identity. If, if I can uh, interject there and maybe put my <coughs> own little viewpoint on that, um, it's very important to always make that distinction we're not talking about kids we're not talking about the little kids and we don't know what's going on with these ROGD kids that suddenly decide after puberty most of the research that we have available to us today is dealing specifically with either very young children who haven't hit puberty yet or the autogynophilic males, which are already adults. This is a whole new phenomenon. They don't have the research on it. And that's partly why, at least maybe it's a start. And I'm not a researcher, but I'm asking a few questions to see. And I'm, I'd be happy to share them with you if you're interested later on. Right. And again, all this information will be in the description. And by asking questions, this is what's so important, by asking questions, we're not being hateful. We're not trying to deny the existence of trans people. We just want answers. We want to make sure that before somebody embarks on a life-altering path, because the research shows once someone does go on this path, even if they are not trans, they are far more likely to stay on that path. And there's different numbers, anywhere between 40 and 80. I've seen one study with 90%. They say that if a child is left alone to their own devices, up to 90% of kids will say, I'm not trans. Don't know what I was thinking, I'm not. Now the trans activists say that's because these were not real trans kids to begin with, therefore they desisted. They didn't continue in this belief. Exactly. The point is, if so many children who are not trans 
are being treated as if they are trans and they are being given puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and then eventually surgery. Because once again, when they're on that path, they're more likely to continue on that path. At the very least, even if they don't have surgery, after several months of being on these cross-sex hormones, there's a very good chance that they will no longer be able to have children. So somebody at the age of 12, 13, 14, or younger who's made this decision and had this decision affirmed and is being told this is the right thing, at this point, to suddenly put on the brakes and go, whoa, I made a terrible mistake. Most people can't do that. So they convince themselves, yes, this is what's right for me. And there is a lot of regret among a certain number of people. Now, the question is, how big is that number? Well, some activists say it's 2%, it's 4%, it's 5% at most. The problem is, and if you watch my videos, the link is there with James Caspian, when somebody tries to do the research on this to find out, well, what percentage of people regret having the surgery? What percentage of people regret having hormones and so on? When they try to do this research, they get shut they get down. Is it, they get shut down for doing research. Which is what's supposed to guide best practice they're not allowed to best practice really and that's literally what is happening it's ideology trumping science research and the best interest of children and adults or adolescents as well so this is why i wanted to have a guest on who through her website has heard from over 300 parents who've experienced the same thing one website we've only been up for two months in only two months 300 people multiply that by all the different potential websites over a number of future months and we're going to see we do have an epidemic on our hands and again it's not just playing make-believe it's not just indulging someone's wish to be a goth child or to shave their head or to get a tattoo these are life changing decisions that they're making from a very young age and we should not give them that decision not at that age no. I had another mother on a month ago who was talking about her own experience with the system and what happened with her child. And sadly, her story could be anybody's story because there are so many cases. So Susanna is familiar with one particular case, a mother called Marla, and she's going to talk about what happened with this mother. And again, this is one dramatic story, but when you speak to enough parents, you realize it's not unique. There are many people with the same type of experience. Her story is posted on the Parents of ROGD Kids website. It's under the title An Orwellian Nightmare because truly it is Orwellian. This child, again, was fine all the way up until she was, well, she started to encounter mental health issues around puberty again, but still no indication of any gender dysphoria or something until I think she must have read something or on the internet at age 15 uh, she suddenly decided she was transgender and according to the mother from that time forward everything just went to pot she used to have straight A's and now she was just within one term it went downhill she started doing drugs she started becoming very rebellious and cutting school it's just a typical but it, it seemed to start with that transgender thing and at, at that point too she was starting to have difficulty with her parents but nobody knew what was going on I think it was when she was 16 she just left home and went to live with her aunt who lived in another city five hours away and uh, there she came out as transgender and her aunt was very sympathetic towards because she was she had read what to do I think she went on the websites to find out what to do with this kid and read it's important to affirm it's important to surround them with unconditional love and encourage them and so they decided to enroll her in school as a boy uh, the school right away hopped on it and accepted it that's fine they all started uh, treating her as a boy wearing chest binders they said they bought her a chest mm -hmm. binder uh, the and these chest binders, sorry, these chest binders, they can cause damage to your ribs, to your uh, circulation, to your breathing. They're not harmless, and they can cause permanent damage as well. But they're being sold and passed off as these harmless things as it's in the kid's best interest. Same with the hormones. Um, and before we go any further, when we talk about puberty blockers, they say, what's the problem of delaying puberty for a few months or a few years while the kid makes the decision? The problem is, psychologically, you're delaying this child's progression into another stage of life, a psychosocial stage. And if you go on these puberty blockers, you can't go on them forever. So the decision has to be made. And as I said earlier, once you're on that path, the next step is cross-sex hormones. And I need to stress this. Once you've gone on these cross-sex hormones for a few months, there's a very high probability that you will be sterile. 
You cannot have children. So again, think about this. It's not like they're 25, 30 years old and making these decisions. They're starting on this path post-puberty, sometimes before puberty, depending on when they manifest this. There's different types of children. The ROG kids are almost always post-puberty, but the fact is we are basically setting them on a path toward a huge life-altering decision. And again, even if the most minimal, the most conservative estimates are 56% of children will desist. They will go back and say, that's not who I am. It's a 50-50 chance that a child is being put on the wrong path, at least, at minimum, bare minimum. Uh, Dr. Amite, I would say with the ROGD kids, they don't know. Mm -hmm. They don't know. Right. And, and I'm guessing uh, because they've been happy with their gender all the way up until then, and they've gone through all that development right up until then, my guess would be it's even higher. So the statistics that we're saying that they have right. are for young children. Right. My guess is it's even higher. That oh, the I desistance have no rate. doubt. I have no doubt. And here's the thing. Again, when activists hear all this, they go, the only reason they are desisting, the only reason they're saying I'm not trans is because of the social pressure, because their family is putting that pressure on them, or they're going to their church and the church is beating it out of them. And the fact is, there are some people who can say that was their experience. But a couple of anecdotes do not negate the so many people are having this experience. And again, think about this. A child from a very, very young age, before they even understand sexuality, sexual orientation, and all this stuff, if they are different, if they truly are, there is a pretty good chance that as they get older, they will say, this is not the right sex for me. But for someone who's never shown any signs, it's very rarely happened before. Can I also ask you from mm -hmm. your experience, um, I'm guessing that it's pretty obvious to the parents too. If you have a child who really is one of those other categories that um, Drs. Bailey and Blanchard described, um, I think from what I understand, you can't miss it. Like from parents can't miss it. See, now there's two sides to that. I asked Dr. Blanchard that in my video and he said, okay. yeah, parents can't miss it. But then there are some people who retrospectively or retroactively say, well, you know what? I never came out a certain way, like whether it's sexual orientation, whether it's a boy being very effeminate or something. That's what they claim. But we know that retrospective histories or you know, looking back on your past are not that accurate. So people do revise history. So you will hear many people say, no, 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 I always knew it, but I hid it and so on. But other people saying that can't be. Yeah, right? I think the parents... Um, excuse me for being maybe over general. I've had four of them. I know what I'm talking about. I think often the parents, especially when they're young, the parents know the kids better than the kids do. The kids aren't right. really that aware of what they're doing but that's and how when they're behaving. Right. But that's when people say, well, with sexual orientation, so many parents never knew or they were willfully ignorant oh, to so it. Oh, so it's just like right. that. But the difference is if you are, for example, a gay boy, yes, many gay boys are going to be very effeminate. And parents do miss that. Some parents will miss that and they'll write it off as something else. But the fact is, not every gay boy is going to be very effeminate. Not every gay girl is going to be a tomboy or a butch or something like that. So using these comparisons, in some cases they may be accurate, but not always. So there are many gay children who didn't show these signs, so that's why the parents didn't recognize it. And other children who were very, very obvious, and parents saw it, they didn't say anything. So people are picking and choosing whatever story suits their needs and that's why i'm doing this series of interviews because i want to hear from all voices and i want to give everybody a chance to speak about this so other people hearing this can get a more balanced comprehensive and nuanced idea or perspective on this because there's no simple answers but the sad thing is too many of the gender clinics too many of the trans activists do make it look like there are simple answers and the simple answer is just affirm and they're going to do better and I interrupted you with Marla's story but I want to add something before you continue with Marla's story that in speaking to other people who deal with these issues what they find is that once a child says okay trans this is it this becomes their life they become obsessed over it and it's not as if it's really that affirming yes they're having other people affirm them and say it's okay it's great congratulations and they get that high but then their whole life revolves around this and what does it revolve around well the fact is i haven't transitioned yet so i'm not the person i want to be and if that's their only focus never mind that they're doing well in school never mind that they're popular never mind that maybe they're doing sports or something else that's all secondary to the fact that i'm not who i really need to be they get so really convinced and they're convinced about this but it's obsessive 
It's obsessive, and they're being surrounded by other people who are adopting the same mindset, and they're feeding into each other, and it becomes so unhealthy because, again, all you're doing is looking at who you are not, what you are not, and they're fantasizing of how great it's going to be when they get older, and it's like a child. I mean, look, most, I hate to stereotype, but most girls dream of this, you know, magical wedding and so on, and if that's all they ever thought about and said, why am I not married? Why am I not married? Why am I not married? Their whole childhood, adolescence, early adult until they get married would be miserable because they're not living this life they think they're supposed to live. And that's what parents have to recognize. And so these people who I've spoken with who work with these children, when they back away from this whole trans aspect of them, when they look at other parts of their life and try to help them out here or there, their depression, their anxiety, it starts to reduce because they're not focusing only on this one aspect, which again, nothing they can do about it at that time. They're focusing on what they can work on, how they can improve their relationships, their self-esteem, how they're functioning in life. And that's what we need to do in order to help children develop and make it through whatever they're going through. And out of this vast number of kids who are coming out, maybe 1%, maybe 2 who knows, some, a tiny percentage will decide as they get older, this is the path for me. And if that's the case, so be it. I've said it many times. I fully support their need to transition. But we should not do that until they've had a long, long discussion, lots of therapy, lots of proper support, not just gender affirmation. And again, I'll say it one more time. Please understand human psychology. When you're put on a path saying this is the right way, this is you, even if it's not the right path, very many people will just desperately cling to it. And I'm going to go back to sexual orientation. Many people who know, a big part of them knows that they're gay, yet they think if I just do what society expects of me, I get married, I have kids, I pretend that I'm not gay, maybe somehow that will help me live this life. And they put on the mask and they live 10, 20, 30, 40 years of this false existence. But it's always there and they know it's not them. A part of them knows it's not them and they struggle with that. So for a trans kid who's not really trans, but they're being told this is what you should do and they're going on that path, there's a part of them that knows this really isn't me. But they're so terrified to go against it. And if you do go against it, guess what? Your social groups, suddenly you're out. Do, yeah. They lose this one thing that they found. Finally, I have an identity. I have these people just like me. They love me. They accept me. And I'm going to lose it all if I get rid of this. This is terrifying. So before you start doing this rapid affirming of kids without even questioning them, and I want Susanna to show some information in these gender clinics, these best practices on how to deal with kids like this, people have to understand that as soon as you take these steps so quickly, you really are pushing kids in the wrong direction in many cases. It's a one-way road. And it is a one-way road, and it's very scary to get off of it.